okay? Okay. There Thank you go. Thank you very much, Ray. I'm so excited to have uh, Hannah Wall speak to us tonight. This is really great. Uh, some of you may know Hannah. She's a Berkshire native. She went to Lenox High School. She did her undergraduate work at Brown University. Uh, she has a PhD from, uh, from uh, Northwestern and she did postgraduate work at Columbia University. She is now an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California in Santa Barbara, California. She's been published in uh, leading sociology journals and uh, she's gonna talk, talk to us tonight. Uh, we will uh, save questions until the end. Uh, please put them in the chat. And uh, once Hannah is finished, I will start reading the questions and we'll take it from there. All yours, Hannah, thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and thank you everyone for having me. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Start this from the beginning. Um, so you should be all able to see my screen. Um, it's just really a pleasure to be here, especially as a Berkshire's native, to be able to talk to you all. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to discuss some of the ideas in my book, Bound by Creativity, which was published in June by University of Chicago Press. And this is a, a book cover with art from artist B. Wirtz, who is one of the subjects who you'll meet later in the book. Um, and Bound by Creativity is currently available for purchase at the Lenox Bookstore. If you're not currently based in the Berkshires, you can also get it um, at the University of Chicago Press website or Amazon or from other booksellers. So I'm gonna talk by, start by talking about Lucky de Bellevue, who is one of the artists that I studied. Lucky de Bellevue uh, produced these sculptures of woven pipe cleaners, widely exhibited, uh, exhibiting them in galleries and museums, including the prestigious Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. The New York Times reviewed the work, calling Lucky the quote, pipe cleaner guy. Suddenly, after about a decade of producing these works, Lucky stopped. He confessed to me that after about 10 years of producing these sculptures, he could not think of further variations of this formal element. He said, I had already done so many permutations and so many formal ideas and reference things enough to, I, to where I just reached the end of it. While the pipe cleaners were an unusual medium that was highly recognizable, Lucky perceived there to be only so many ways to weave together pipe cleaners before mind-numbing boredom set in, even though collectors' demand for these works persisted. Lucky experimented with printmaking for the next 15 years, producing works like this that you can see on the right-hand side by printing abstract shapes and pasting pistachio shells onto linen canvases or reusable shopping bags. And you can see pistachio shells on a shopping bag here. Lucky described the new works to me as conceptually consistent with his pipe cleaner sculptures. He viewed the media to be everyday rather than high art materials, and he saw the works as displaying his commitment towards the DIY or do-it-yourself movement. But galleries did not want to show the new work, and his sales dwindled. Finally, Lucky was offered representation by a new gallery on the Lower East Side. I accompanied Lucky and his new dealer, Mark Beckman, to an art fair in New York, where I helped them install the exhibition and talk to collectors about the work. And here you can see us uh, installing the exhibition on the left uh, hand side here and a collector looking at the works on the right hand side. Mark told me that I should parrot his talking point saying, quote, if they mention the pipe cleaners, say that on principle, he's doing the same thing by dignifying non-traditional art making. So you can say that he's associated with DIY. Another umbrella theme is that his work uses humor. Mark downplayed the formal variations in Lucky's work and emphasized broad conceptual consistencies in an attempt to convince collectors that Lucky had a cohesive creative vision in which his new series was a conceptual variation of his more celebrated iconic work. For the next nine hours of the fair's VIP opening, collectors, curators, and critics meandered into the booth. Peter Hort, one of the collectors who we met earlier, uh, walked in, uh, or, or one of the collectors who we'll meet later, walked in um, and exclaimed in surprise, this is lucky, I have his pipe cleaners. All day, I heard variations of this comment. Mark and I highlighted the conceptual consistencies in Lucky's creative vision 
and showed collectors catalogs and books of Lucky's work, which displayed images of both the old and new works. By the end of the fair, Mark was chain smoking outside a back door of the auditorium, fingers quivering with anxiety. Renting a booth alone for four days cost him $9,000, and a collector had just reneged on his only potential sale. So the story of Lucky de Bellevue's work and career elicited many questions from me as a sociologist. Why would Lucky devote 15 years to producing pipe cleaner sculptures? And why would he believe that pipe cleaners and pistachio shells were part of the same, quote, language? Why would Mark exhibit Lucky's new work after a critic questioned why Lucky would bother doing anything else? And why were the pipe cleaner sculptures, but not the pistachio shell canvases, so vividly ingrained in collectors' minds? So for me, these questions hit upon the core nature of art. And un I'll unravel some of these questions in this talk through a sociological lens. The contemporary art world is a fascinating place to me because there's very little consensus in this field about what counts as good art. This is a field where anything goes. It's not necessarily about making something beautiful or even something that requires technical skill but instead about capturing an idea with a form. So when we judge contemporary art, we're not judging what counts as aesthetically pleasing, but what kind of form captures an abstract theory or emotion or theme. And we don't widely agree when forms capture these ideas in an original and compelling way. So these are some photos from my ethnography. And as you can see here, a work of art could be a pile of rubble. It could be a clothesline of socks. And these works can sell for thousands or sometimes millions of dollars. As I studied the contemporary art world, I became really interested in how artists made aesthetic judgments during the creative process in the absence of clear criteria for what makes art good or bad. While we can think of creativity more broadly, when we talk about creativity in different cultural fields like art or music or literature, we're usually talking about what artists do to make creative products. So when I ask what is creativity in the contemporary art world, I'm really asking how do artists make decisions during the creative process? In this process, artists are making aesthetic judgments that ultimately result in creative products. So how does an artist like Lucky make decisions that result in these, this web of pipe cleaners, for example? And when I talk about aesthetic judgments, I mean judgments about what constitutes a good work of art. So how does Lucky decide that these pipe cleaners constitute good art? I conducted my research in New York City, and this is a globalized market, but New York City is the epicenter of the contemporary art market. Um, I did this research from 2014 to 2015, 16, and again in 2018. Um, and I conducted ethnographic field work, which means that I observed and participated in a wide variety of settings in the art world, um, including going to exhibitions, going to exhibition installations, hanging out in artist studios, going to VIP parties with collectors, um, following collectors around the art world as they decided what work to buy. And I also interviewed over 100 artists, dealers, curators, collectors, and art advisors. And because I'm discussing specific works of art, I use most people's real names with their permission. So these photos here show the process of installing an exhibition, socializing in artist studios, going to art fairs and parties. Um, and as a, as a note, the picture on the bottom right here might look like a museum. This is actually part of a six story home of a private collector in Manhattan. The contemporary art world is a center of elite culture. So most works are priced in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars. Collectors usually own hundreds or thousands of works at these price points. And in fact, they only consider themselves collectors once they have a storage unit for their art. And as you can probably tell from the photos on the left of artists versus those on the right of collectors, these are really different social scenes. So it was very interesting to me as an ethnographer to traverse these social spaces and also watch them collide as artists interact with collectors and art others in the art world. So artists are going to fairs and parties with collectors and collectors are also going into artist studios. 
So I interviewed all artists in their studios, and often I would return to the studio every few months to see how their work had changed. So these are usually messy and hectic spaces, as you can see on the photo. In the photo on the right, um, this is a chicken coop in the, with live chickens in the middle of the studio. Sometimes there are studio assistants who are prepping a canvas or plugging something into a database, but most of the time, artists are alone. Studios are usually packed with art in different stages of progress, including source material, sketches and models, unfinished work, as well as abandoned work and finished work. And this allowed me to see how artists um, made decisions at various stages of the creative process. So um, I looked at all of these works at different stages of the process to see um, and asked artists about how they made decisions at these different stages. I'll first show how people in the art world discuss what creativity is, and I'll highlight this idea of having a creative vision. These narratives of creativity are important because they influence how artists experiment in their studio. Then moving into the studio, I'll show how artists use a process of experimentation that results in what they view as a creative vision. And I'll show how the structure of the creative process itself ultimately reinforces certain ways of judging creativity. And finally, I'll show how, as artists' work circulates through the art world over time, these collective orientations of judging creativity and these perceptions of particular artists' creative visions can ultimately constrain what artists can produce. So taken together, I'll show how artists don't actually experiment with infinite possibilities, even though we're, they're in this world where um, anything goes, suppose, supposedly, but instead they uh, experiment within a set of parameters, and they develop these parameters over time through the process of experimentation. And this process of experimentation is informed by their interactions in the art world. So ultimately, Creativity is bound by the idea of creativity itself and the structure of the creative process. So I'll jump into the art world now, and I'll start by looking at how creativity is judged within the art world. As I'll show, people in the art world discuss good artists as those who have artistic autonomy, aesthetic commitment, and continued experimentation. And taken together, they see these as the mark of a true creative vision. The first quote here is from a dealer in a critically acclaimed gallery in Chinatown. So we're sitting in the back room of the gallery in the evening after the gallery has closed and she's stuck at work waiting for an artist who is currently missing their meeting. So she vents to me and excuse her French, they are effing psycho, lazy, useless, undependable. Okay, so artists sometimes it's probably not their fault that they are completely incapable of taking care of themselves. They are just in a permanent childlike state and actually making art and having someone else sell for them is the only way they could ever survive as people because they would otherwise be homeless. And I guess they can kind of be visionary and inspiring in one way or another, but they are those kinds of really hopeless people. So in this narrative, we get this very pejorative image of the artist as someone who's an incompetent person who can't deal with normal adult responsibilities, but also has the saving grace of being a quote, visionary. And this is another dealer in an established Chelsea gallery talking about the role of dealers in relation to the artists that their gallery represents. So here the dealer says, we are not co-producers of the artwork. So a good art dealer is not, is not trying to influence the way something is going to be created because you are just going to cloud that. If that artist is looking to their dealer for advice on how to paint something, there is no place for them in this art world. They need to trust their own vision. So you can't be like, you know, I think that should be blue. So this dealer is saying that true artists have to follow their own vision, which can't be dictated by others. I'll highlight a couple of points. First, artists are seen to be incapable of dealing with non-creative aspects of their professional lives, such as financial decisions. This had a real impact on artists' relationships with their dealers. For example, artists represented by dealers do not set their own prices and often, often don't even know the prices of their own works because they're seen as financially incompetent and as, um, as needing to buffer financial decisions from their creative process. 
However, there's this supposed sphere of aesthetic autonomy surrounding the artist. Artists are supposed to be able to make their own creative decisions and be able to find their own way in the studio without having others tell them what to do. And dealers were expected to respect this. So for example, even though dealers often know what's more marketable, they would find indirect ways to tell artists this and even sometimes show work that they did not expect would sell. So there's a sphere of creative autonomy and within this space, artists are supposed to produce a vision. So what we see emerging is the idea that true artists have a creative vision and that this is what makes their work original and aesthetically important. Supporting this concept of the creative vision is the idea that true artists have an enduring obsession with or commitment to certain aesthetic themes. So this collector and I visited a studio of an emerging artist in Queens together. The artist spent several years making sculptures of pink pillbox hats meticulously positioned to mirror the trajectory of Jackie O's hat during JFK's assassination. And she did this by analyzing, analyzing seven seconds of film footage frame by frame. So the collector says, you are still not done. And the artist says, no, every time I finish one, I have to make another. I probably have between four and six left in this section of film. And the collector says, oh God, I'm overwhelmed. And then later in the visit, the collector says, what galleries have come through? What about Tanya Banakdar? And that's a very established uh, gallery. She would love this. And the artist says, I would love an introduction. I haven't really sought out a gallery. I've just been working. And the collector says, as you should be. And the artist replies, I'm a bit of a cave dweller. And later in the cab going back to Manhattan, the collector turns to me and says, she's obsessed. So here we see both the artist and the collector emphasizing the artist's obsession with this theme. And we also see the artist downplaying professional savviness. Together, the artist and collector communicate their view that continuing to explore the same themes over and over time represents aesthetic obsession and that this is the mark of a true creative vision. And as a side note, collectors like doing studio visits with artists in part because they felt like getting to know the artist personally and seeing their studio space gave them further insight into artists' creative visions because they viewed the artist's creative vision as associated with the artist's identity as a person more broadly. While consistency is seen as the mark of a true artist, artists are, not, are expected not to take this too far. So here I was walking around a major contemporary art fair with a collector and several of the collector's friends. The collector stopped in one booth and said to his friends, that's a John Testoni. It has that look. It doesn't look like anyone else. I could tell right away just by glancing. He added cat litter to his paintings to give it a wonderful rough texture. It brought it up a notch. What makes a great artist, you progress. He struggles. If you talk to him, he's like, I don't know. And with any, any artist, not everything he makes is incredible, but he self edits. So there's this consistency because he can tell that it's a pastone just by seeing the image, but he also highlights that the artist is willing to continue to experiment even to the point of floundering or failing. So in this narrative, consistency is seen to be evidence of aesthetic commitment and variation is seen to be evidence of a willingness to experiment. In the art world, it was not enough to have either aesthetic commitment or a willingness to experiment. Instead, this was something artists needed to balance and manage this balance over time. So this brings me to the concept of a creative vision. And this is also sometimes referred to as a signature style in the art world, although the term signature style can be used pejoratively. So I define creative visions as what people perceive as a bundle of recognizable and enduring elements within an artist's body of work. People believe that the creative vision also evolves over time. So the creative vision embodies values of both aesthetic commitment and experimentation. This value placed on the creative vision oriented people's aesthetic judgments. So for example, I saw collectors pass up new works by well-known artists whose work they already owned because they felt like the new series either was too much of a departure from the artist's previous work or that the artist's work hadn't changed enough. So narratives of creativity influenced how artists experimented in the studio. 
And I'm now gonna bring us into the studio so that we can see how these narratives of creativity, like these ideas attached to consistency and variation that we discussed, were actually enacted in the creative process. So how does an artist create a body of work that seemed to have a true creative vision um, balancing this consistency and variation? Artists recognized that the creative process was highly uncertain. When they experimented with new elements, like a new material or technique, they could not quite imagine what result they were going to get. This uncertainty was a risk. They needed to produce work that would be judged as representing a unique creative vision, so they couldn't spend all their time and money making work that others wouldn't want to buy. To manage this uncertainty, they used what I called low stakes experimentation. In other words, they tested out ideas efficiently by using fast processes of production and inexpensive materials. Some common examples of low stakes experiments are sketches and models. And we can also think of this as something that happens across creative industries. So in my work, low stakes experiments tend to be my early drafts. In this image, you can see artist Davina Tsemo's work. These are big pieces of leather, which she would pour hot cement over. And on the right-hand side here, you can see some leather test strips that she made to see how the leather would react to the cement at different thicknesses. So here, uh, she, on the right-hand side, she, or on the left-hand side, she uh, began by producing smaller squares and then made larger squares. And she started repeating certain elements while varying other conditions. And as she did so, she reduced uncertainty in various elements because she learned how um, to predict the leather to react to different techniques. So for example, she thought that this modeled effect that you can see on this leather on the right hand, the left hand side was due to the cement dyeing the leather. But when she varied the color of the leather, she realized that it was actually the cement burning the leather. And as she understood different elements, she started incorporating multiple elements into the same piece, such as hanging chains from the painting or even molding the cement around the chains. So this process of testing individual elements and then adding them together allowed for more formal complexity. So we can see that artists allowed heightened uncertainty during low stakes experimentation, and then they reduce uncertainty later in the creative process as they develop what I call creative competencies or more refined expectations of material results through repeat repeated testing. As artists repeated certain elements across different works, they created consistencies within their bodies of work. And consistencies were crucial to develop, developing creative competencies or these better predictions of material results, which allowed them to have more control over the creative process. Artists' idea of, about what was relevant to their creative visions guided initial low stakes experimentation. So this is a quote from artist B. Wirtz, whose work you saw on my book cover. He said, I felt I needed to limit the scope of what was available to me in terms of found objects because it was just too overwhelming. And it makes you have more freedom in a way because you have to be more inventive with what you do. If you limit it, then you have to think of other things to do. B's work was composed around the themes of bare necessities, which he called eating, drinking, and staying warm. His work involved mostly sculptures made of different mundane objects like clothing or kitchenware. And he'd incorporate these with wood, metal, wire, and other materials. These perceptions that these materials and themes were relevant to his creative vision arose through the process of experimentation and then channeled future low stakes experimentation. Putting parameters on his source material allows him to do low stakes experiments in an effective way because it makes the possibilities not limitless. And this is another reason why consistencies occurred during the creative process. As he produced new works, he looked back on the body of work to identify further consistencies. And this was important in order to create a coherent narrative of his creative vision to both himself and, and other people. Here, B's talking about recognizing consistencies in his work during the process of putting together a retrospective exhibition, which is a big solo exhibition that covers multiple previous series. B said, I hadn't seen so much of it over such a long period together like that ever before. It was really, I was really surprised at how weirdly consistent I had been. 
And that was interesting to me because I thought, this is really who I am, but it wasn't just repeating either. So here we see that artists started by experimenting with ideas that they thought might be relevant to their creative vision. And the process of experimentation required them to repeat certain elements so that they could see how these elements would react to different materials and techniques. And then they look back at their work and recognize consistencies, which further strengthens their perceptions that these elements characterize their authentic, distinctive creative visions, and they become more committed to these elements. Artists, though, could not just use the same elements over and over because they would get bored and other people would see their creative visions as stagnant. So they needed a way to introduce variations into the creative process, while at the same time making work still seem representative of their creative visions. B explains here how he took on new challenges by incorporating materials that he did not normally use. And here he's talking about using a pink plastic toy that his friend gave to him. He said, I started with this because someone gave me this thing. Some friend had it and he thought, oh, B would like that. So he said, oh, you can have it. So he gave me that. And this is not something I would normally, well, okay, I use these kinds of hanging things, but not like a pink one. So this is a little different, a little weird. And I say, yeah, it's a little too plasticky, fabricated. And B says, yeah, kid-like. And so I thought, oh, that's an interesting challenge. What can I do with it? So I had this idea okay, I think I'll hang wooden clothespins from it. And then I thought, now how am I going to display it? So it was going to be like a smaller thing with something holding it. And then I thought, well, I'll make this bigger structure and then it needs more height. And so here you can see B built this whole structure around the pink plastic toy, which is on the left-hand side here in an effort to make this fit within his body of work. But when I returned a few months later, the structure was still there, but the pink toy had been removed and replaced with a cloth napkin. The napkin was related to the concept of domesticity, which was prevalent in his work. And unlike the pink plastic toy, the napkin was also in a more similar palette to the rest of his works and also was made with what he viewed as a natural fabric. So this is a case where an artist tried, but ultimately did not use a new element because the artist could not experiment to a point where he felt like the work was both representative of his enduring commitment and his desire for continued experimentation. So ultimately the work wasn't representing his creative vision to him. But a couple months later when I visited B, he was working on this new piece, which he called Kitchen Trees. He was invited to do an art sculpture for the Public Art Fund, which is an arts nonprofit in New York City. And this was ultimately displayed in City Hall Park in downtown Manhattan. The work had to be large scale and weatherproof, which created a challenge for B since he usually made small sculptures with everyday objects. So he had to figure out how to make this fit with his creative vision while also incorporating new elements. And ultimately we see that he made this work out of durable materials like colanders. So this uh, column here is made out of colanders and plastic vegetables that he still connected to the themes of domesticity. As we can see, artists use processes of experimentation that allow them to produce and recognize consistencies that they associate with their creative visions while also introducing new elements that they come to connect to these creative, creative visions as well. The creative vision becomes something that artists and others can recognize without being static. Artists' processes of experimentation are influenced by narratives of creativity, but narratives of creativity are also influenced by how artists and others perceive the creative process. For example, dealers are exposed to the creative process through their interactions with artists and studio visits. They see that different artists have different levels of creative output based on their techniques and also go through ebbs and flows in terms of production. These understandings of the creative process shape how dealers do their own work. So for example, dealers will have different artists exhibit their work with different frequencies and they make somewhat flexible exhibition schedules. While artists can in theory experiment with infinite elements in this world where anything goes, in practice, artists' actual creative processes are bound in different ways. As we've seen, artists are influenced by narratives of creativity that circulate in the art world. As artists 
experiment in their studios, they repeat certain elements and associate their work with these elements in a way that they come to see as parameters on the kind of work that they do. So these practices of experimentation also bound the creative process. Finally, as work leave the studio, we will now see how other people's perceptions of specific creative visions further place boundaries on how artists experiment. So I'll end by discussing the different ways that the creative process is bound by the social world. I'll discuss this last point using the case of Catherine Bernhardt. Catherine first became known for her sloppily painted fashion models, as shown here, which sold well and received positive reviews. After a couple of years, Catherine felt like she was finished with these works and began making collaborative works with her husband, consisting on, uh, of collaging African textiles on canvases, which she referred to as rug paintings. And you can see one of these on the right-hand corner of the photo with Catherine and her son. Catherine described the difficulty in exhibiting and selling the rug paintings. She said Canada, this was her gallery, said that they wanted to show paintings only from me, not collaborative work. When they told me that, I was only making collages. So I was like, whatever, I'm making collages. So I made them anyway, and we had a show at the Hole. This was a lesser known gallery in Brooklyn. After the collages, Canada was still like, we want a painting show, painting, painting, painting. So I was like, okay, and I came up with this. And having witnessed these kinds of conversations, it's likely that the dealer said this in a more indirect way, but this was the clear message that she took away. Catherine showed me her new series, paintings filled with cigarettes, lipstick, and juice boxes in the same sloppily painted style as her previous series of models. And she told me that the series sold out. So although Catherine initially sidestepped Canada's refusal of her new works by continuing to produce the rug collages, she ultimately returned to producing her series in the more recognizable painting style and exhibiting them at Canada. A year later, I walked into Canada's booth at Fries, one of New York's biggest fairs, and asked the dealer the price of Bernhard's two paintings of toilet paper, tacos, and Pac-Men, one of which is pictured here on the far wall, as well as the price of her three rug collages, one of which is pictured here on the near wall. He replied that the paintings cost $25,000 and $30,000 each, but that the rug collages were only $6,000 each. Why the price discrepancy, I asked. They're about the same size. Well, she's really more noted for these kinds of paintings, he explained. So here we see that when artists become known for a certain kind of work, this is the work that's most in demand and priced the highest. And this is because collectors value the artist for what they believe is original about the work, which they view as represented by the creative vision. So as we saw from looking at the creative process, developing creative competencies in order to make a new series takes a lot of time and effort, and artists can risk being judged as not committed enough to the new idea for it to be considered a core process, a core part of their creative vision. And this is especially um, a risk for more established artists who, for whom audiences have a really solidified perception of what is iconic about their work. It can become really difficult to overcome those perceptions of iconicity. So artists who become noted for certain elements can face challenges when they try to, to introduce new variations, even if, in theory, dealers and collectors think they should be free to experiment. So I wanna make some concluding comments now. I started with this question of how artists make creative decisions without a consensus in the field about what is good art. And artists deal with this by sidestepping objectivity when it comes to aesthetic judgments. Artists don't talk about their work as objectively good or bad. Instead, they judge their work in terms of its relevance to their distinctive creative vision. In the art world, this idea of having a creative vision, which is demonstrated by this um, aesthetic autonomy and this balance of consistency and variation is really fundamental. Artists' perceptions of their creative visions arise through the process of experimentation. Through these moment-to-moment -moment decisions, artists develop a cluster of consistencies within their body of work, which they recognize as composing their distinctive creative vision. 
So artists' distinctive creative visions arise through the ongoing creative process through which artists experiment and identify with certain core and enduring elements. And as we've seen, uh, creativity then ultimately becomes bound by these ideas of creativity itself. We saw these, this association of creativity with this balance of consistency and variation. These parameters are to set during the creative process. And we see how um, artists through experimentation come to see certain parameters as associated with their creative visions. And also art audiences' perceptions of each artist's creative vision. So as the work circulates through the social world, certain audiences gain certain perceptions of what's iconic within the artist's body of work. So returning once more to our pipe cleaner guy, we can see these boundaries at work. And so Lucky believed that he should make work that was consistent with core elements in his creative vision, while also continuing to experiment with new media techniques and themes. He developed understandings about what was consistent with his creative vision through the process of experimenting in the studio. Lucky made different variations of pipe cleaner sculptures to understand how new materials would react in the creative process. And as he made more and more of these works, he increasingly identified them with his creative vision. But as he reduced uncertainty in the creative process, he eventually became bored which led him to search for new materials and techniques like pistachio shells that he viewed as still fitting within the parameters of his creative vision. But unfortunately, not everyone's understanding of Lucky's creative vision included pistachio shells. So collectors valued Lucky's work for what they believed was most distinctive and valuable about it or distinctive and original about it. So they valued him for being the quote unquote pipe cleaner guy. And Lucky struggled with a loss of exhibition opportunities and sales when he made work that others did not see as a core part of his creative vision. So while Lucky was exposed to all of his work and all of even his ideas about his work, other collectors, uh, collectors and dealers were only exposed to the specific slice of his body of work that they had come in contact with. And for most of them, the, those were the pipe cleaner sculptures. So this was what had really stuck in their mind. While a lack of consensus over what good art in the contemporary art world means in, the in theory that artists can make anything, in reality, we see that this is not the case. So in practice, artists' aesthetic judgments are oriented by their understandings of their creative visions, which are evolving through the creative process and also constrained by how other people judge their work. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your thoughts. So I'm gonna stop my screen share now and um, go back to the main room. And um, I see- um, I'm back. Uh, uh, Ray is saying, uh, please put your questions in the chat. Um, and um, and I see Dee's hand, oh, um, let's see. So I see, do you wanna uh, field these, Randy, or do you want me to? Uh, let me ask you uh, my question first. <laughs> If I may, uh, then we'll let other people from the the chat. Uh, but I'm I'm certainly I'd like for you to talk more about um, the creative process versus the necessity to make a living. And uh, I'm sure these artists must be influenced by that uh, one way or the other. Uh, uh, can this be a positive thing in some regards, or it, does it so stifle their creative vision that they maybe they lose all all creativity and uh, they hurt themselves in the end? Yeah, that's a really great question, and I, you see it a little bit with the story of Catherine, and in that story, she at first says, "Oh, I don't care what people want me to make. This is what I'm making." Ultimately, we do see her coming back to her, her more recognizable style. We see those being priced much, much more highly. And so we can understand why that pressure would exist, especially with New York City rent being what it is um, and just the cost of, of running a studio in New York. Um, so what I saw was that um, these economic pressures and not just economic pressures, but also sort of social pressures for recognition, prestige, um, especially in New York City, where it was highly competitive, where um, where 
just so many people were struggling for recognition. I saw this affecting artists a different, differently depending on their career stage. So for artists that were just starting out, the pressure was sort of to make something recognizable. So these artists were in group shows. They usually only had the opportunity to show one work. So the pressure was to produce a work that was going to be really, really distinctive. Um, and this would help them get their foot in the art world, basically. And then once artists had had a couple solo shows, now they were showing a greater range of their work. So they would show one series, then in a year or two, show another series. And here then the pressure became to change the work enough so that people didn't think it was stagnant, but then to still have it look representative of, of enough of the creative vision. So collectors would look at it and not think they were getting this sort of one-off work that wouldn't become significant within the body of work. And artists really struggled with that balance and, and um, producing the balance repeatedly over time was really difficult for artists. So one artist I talked to referred to it as overcoming success, which I thought was like a really poignant way of, we don't really think of success as something to be overcome usually, but that was really a struggle for them. Um, and then, at the more established phase, you see artists like Catherine, who the audience and, and like Lucky, where the audience has a really solidified idea of someone as a pipe cleaner guy. Um, and so that was really, so they really struggled to overcome that. And artists at that stage might have a little bit more financial freedom, um, but still they want to continue to exhibit their work in the art world. Um, and, you know, they're still, you know, they still do need to make money. So they really struggle with either um, saying, you know, I'm just going to make what I'm going to make and maybe no one will buy it. Or um, maybe I'll just produce the same thing over and over and people might, maybe there's some market for it, but also maybe people view me as a sellout. So there's really a tough balance between commercial payoff and critical recognition as well. Um, and whether this is a positive thing, um, you know, I think it's tough because I think while in theory, you know, collectors did want artists to experiment and be free to experiment, it was really constraining for artists to feel like they were, had to reproduce their iconic elements over and over. So the artists that I see saw um, feeling like they had more of an ability to maintain that freedom um, while also changing, uh, while, while also still supporting their careers were artists who established fairly early on in their careers that their creative visions were composed around broad conceptual themes that could cut across different media and techniques. Um, but that was really difficult to do. It limited, it limited how recognizable their work was. Um, and often some work was still seen as more iconic than, than others. So I think it was something that all artists faced in, in some way or another. And most of them did not view it as such a productive or positive thing. All right, let's go to the uh, chat. Uh, so Dave Koss, I guess he's from Grand Rapids, says here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I guess, there is a yearly event called Art Prize. Entries are placed throughout the city and we have three weeks to view as many entries as possible, voting on the best who win huge cash prizes. I go to this event, am awed at the creative process and final product that is created. How do artists feel about the response that viewers have and how their work is, crit is critiqued? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I actually interviewed an artist that had won, um, a, won the prize one of the years. Um, and so that's, that's really interesting because it's actually a very rare prize to have that in which um, contemporary art is being judged by basically a mass audience where everyone has one equal yeah. vote. Um, the contemporary art world in the vast majority of cases is not that democratic. Um, so. In the vast majority of cases in the contemporary art world, then uh, you, the people you have as sort of the judges of contemporary art are art critics who are writing for um, a pretty small audience in places like Art Forum or Art, of, art in America, um, maybe the New York Times at most. Um, you have the collectors 
And unlike some other kinds of creative products, like, and, and, and curators as well, and unlike some other creative products where, you know, a movie does well depending on, yes, there's movie critics, but a movie does well depending ultimately on the number of people that buy tickets to it or the number of people that watch it on Netflix. Um, and this is not true in the contemporary art world. In the contemporary art world, you need a relatively low number of people purchasing your work um, for it to main, for you to make your career. Like I could, if I was a contemporary artist, I could have seven collectors that were really invested in buying my work and those seven collectors could sustain my career. So really, unlike most, a lot of other art forms where you, people are buying tickets to things in the contemporary art world, you have a very economically and culturally elite few who decide which artists are gonna make it in terms of getting a positive review, being in a, a museum exhibition, but also which artists are going to sustain their careers um, via having wealthy collectors purchase their work. Um, in terms of sort of how artists feel about that, I would say pretty ambivalent. Um, and so, you know, better about curators and, and critics judging their work because they see these as more legitimate judges. Um, they're much more ambivalent when it comes to their relationships with collectors. Um, first of all, they're ambivalent theoretically about it in terms of, um, you know, they understand how it works, but they feel uncomfortable with the idea that they're spending all of their time making these works. Usually these are very liberal people. Um, and ultimately they're gonna mostly go into a rich collector's storage unit. And so that doesn't make them feel wonderful about their profession. Um, and I think the way that the art world deals with this is by envisioning the role of the collector as a patron um, and so a good collector is someone who will not only support the artist over the course of their career, but also who acts as a quote unquote steward of the work. So if a, co a collector purchases a work, it's expected that if the a museum wants it for an exhibition, the, uh, the collector will lend it out to the museum for the exhibition. So in this way, artists can feel a bit better <laughs> thinking that, okay, the work is going into a storage unit now, but ultimately this collector is paying for other people to at some point, the mass public to be able to see the work for free. And so it, um, that's how they sort of resolve that ambivalence for themselves. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Nancy Johnson says, my impression is that a lot of the purchase dealer biases are related directly to investment and return on investment potential. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so that's interesting. So, I mean, because the collectors are seen as patrons um, and as supporters of the creative vision, um, they cannot adopt a narrative of pure speculation or investment that delegitimizes them as collectors in the art. And so they have to say that even though economic imperatives might impact them, they're really in it first and foremost um, for the love of art. And you see them displaying these narratives um, really sort of prominently in their interactions with other people. So for example, collectors will have VIP open houses. So collectors rotate their collect the works on display every six months to a year. And they invite other collectors and art world people to go to open houses of the new re rehanging of their collection. And often in the re in the hanging, they'll show um, works that may be worth a, a million dollars aside works that are only worth maybe a few thousand dollars. Um, and they purposely put these works next to each other and say, you see, like, I am not in it for the money. I love these works the same. <laughs> A work could be worth a million dollars. It could be worth $2,000. It doesn't matter to me. And so in their narratives to other people, they really, really downplay their economic incentives. Um, I also see this in how they trade recommendations for uh, with other collectors. So 
collectors all talk to each other about which works they're buying. And because relatively few people need to purchase a work for it to go up in economic value, friends talking to each other and then buying the same work really does affect the, the artist's career and the price point of the works. But they really downplay these and say, these aren't recommendations I'm getting. These aren't official recommendations. We're friends. We're just seeing each other in leisure spaces. If we happen to talk about the work, it's just coming up in conversations about what kind of work we like. And they also delegitimize people who hire professional art advisors. And they say those aren't real collectors because they don't follow their own taste. Um, and I would say the one time that collectors admit to um, paying more attention to the investment value is when the work is a quote unquote serious buy for them, which means that for them, it is an expensive work. And that's totally different depending on how wealthy the collector is. Um, and so um, once it reaches a certain price point, then they look at things like, um, has it been acquired in museum collections? Um, has it been included in the Whitney Biennial? Have, have, uh, are other collectors buying it? What are reviews saying about the work? And so they pay more attention to that um, and admit to paying more attention to that when they reach those higher price points. So you're, you're really, you study the art, the modern art world of uh, these collectors who may put their piece in the storage locker or hanging on the wall for six months uh, versus the artist who displays his artwork at the fair in the park. Uh, did you talk to any of those people and did you perceive uh, much of a difference between the art of these two different kinds of artists, class of artists, whatever? Yeah, so I've studied those groups in the past, um, but um, <clears throat> those groups of people who tend to make more representational work really define themselves against, against each other. So, so contemporary artists would not consider that to be contemporary art because it's not based on, usually it's not seen to be based on a theory. Um, the form is not embodying a theory. The form is just supposed to represent life um, in some way. I mean, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting that in a very broad category. Um, and in turn, the people who make more representational work typically you know, sort of discount contemporary art in, under the category of things that my four-year-old could make. So these groups really don't, come in contact with each other. Um, and they're, they have a discrete networks and sets of actors involved. So the collectors and dealers and artists and curators involved in the contemporary art world have virtually no overlap with um, the, the artists and the other people involved in the fair and the park. And so the reason why I didn't cover that part of that art world is because they're really, really discrete art worlds. Um, and the, the contemporary art world is already sort of a vast globalized space, but one that has virtually no overlap. So these are almost as different as comparing like novelists to, to artists um, because they have no actors in common and they don't, um, they don't have the same sort of um, paradigm of art that they're considering on um, aesthetic level. And so in terms of like how creative visions might relate, like I definitely think artists in the park have creative visions, um, but they don't have, but I think that generally speaking, at least the more representational artists, um, my guess is that these are more the based on formal qualities versus conceptual qualities because they're not, the, the theory that is that the form is embodying is not as important. Um, and I think that because the works are priced much lower, you're not going to see the same level of economic imperative. But I think they have creative vision simply because it's really hard for me to Im uh, imagine a scenario in which an artist creates a set of works where what the artist did before has no impact on the new works and they don't, envision any consistencies between them. I think that's something that's really fundamental to the creative process is recognizing consistencies um, 
associating oneself with these consistencies, et cetera. All right. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, let's see, make sure I did not skip anybody. Um, oh, we're, okay. Do you see a difference with artists with, who create digital art? Oh, that's interesting. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, a, uh, I think, a hot topic now, especially with NFTs. Um, so I'll say, you know, I, I don't know to what extent you're asking about NFTs specifically, uh, which are non-fungible tokens um, that are used um, in the form of cryptocurrency. Um, NFTs, it's, it's, in terms of NFTs, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like what I was saying with the artists in the park. Those, there's some, there are some forays into the contemporary art world right now, like an auction of NFTs, a gallery that shows NFTs. But by and large, these are largely discrete groups. So people that make NFTs are different from, um, are not the same people as the contemporary artists in the showing their work in galleries. There's not like a ton of NFT galleries or NFT, like people who are collecting these are, are sort of crypto people, not so much um, traditional contemporary art collectors. And so the, the worlds aren't really overlapping that much. And I think it's remaining, it remains to be seen in the future, the extent to which they will become overlapping. Um, but I kind of think there's going to be, it's like being hyped now and will have a minimal impact on the art world. Um, but, you know, it, digital art, in, in sort of that broader category of digital art has a longer history in the art world. Um, and most of the artists or most of the collectors I interviewed did not collect primarily visual art, although sometimes they had a few visual art pieces. And when artists produce visual art, or sorry, um, digital art, they often exhibited it alongside more traditional art uh, artworks in more traditional media like sculptures or paintings and so the the digital art became something that like made the exhibition more of like an immersive installation and like a uh, while the things that they expected to sell were not the the digital art and so and I the collectors that did um, collect digital art this was somewhat legitimizing that they were willing to um, collect these difficult works because it showed that you know they really loved the works and it wasn't about the money, but they really struggled to maintain them as the technologies um, became sort of obsolete. Things had to be not migrated to new technologies. Um, it was it was sort of awkward to figure out how to display these. Do you have a screen where it's displayed all of the time as a running screen or can it be turned on and off in which case you just have like what looks like a tv there most of the time so it wasn't the most conducive to being in um a, a collector's home and so it, it was it was difficult to sell for that reason okay uh were you viewed as more aligned with either the artists or collectors in your discussions or were you viewed as neutral yeah, that's a great question. I think I was viewed as differently aligned. Um, and it was really interesting to see, you know, how, how people react to you um, based on who they are and who you are in relation to who they are. Um, so with the, with the artists, I think I was seen as more of a peer. So in that sense, I think I was viewed as a little bit more aligned um, in that, um, at least for the younger artists, I was in a similar age um, category, bracket um, you know, they, some of them had recently come out of MFA programs. I was still in grad school at the time I was doing this research. So we were sort of similar educational and cultural background there. And I had, you know, spent a, a lot of time sort of making art, engaging in art history. So I think that was viewed as, as similar. Um, so I sort of engaged with the artists more as peers. Um, with the collectors, they tended to be much well, there's two groups of collectors. Um, one was a group of collectors that were my age, um, and those tended to be children of collectors born into these really wealthy collecting families. And so with them, I was a peer, but it was really difficult for me to engage 
deeply in that social sphere um, because it was so um, economically costly. And so, for example, there are uh, collector circles, they're called, which are basically clubs for collectors that are patrons of museums. Um, but to be in the collector circle, even the younger one, which is the cheaper one, um, it's not only $500 to join, but also $500 per event. Um, and so as a grad student, it was really difficult for me to go to anything outside of the free recruitment events and other socializing activities that, that didn't have these price tags attached to them. Um, with the older collectors, I, I was almost more of a, it was almost more of a paternal relationship because they were my parents' age, in some cases, my closer to my grandparents' age. Um, and so I, so I definitely wouldn't describe that as a peer relationship, but in, in New York, many of the collectors were Jewish. And so um, I think that helped me in terms of access. And then with dealers, it was sort of somewhere in the middle of those two. Um, a lot depended, I think, on age and also how established the, gal the gallery was. Uh, Mary Talbot says, your research is fascinating. Did you start your research with a theory in mind or were you researching with no specific end in mind? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much. Um, so I think I, I started with less of a theory in mind than, that, than maybe than I would have liked, but also because I was trained to use what we call like a pretty inductive approach, which basically means you try to go in without a lot of preconceptions um, and first just try to understand how the world works and how people are oriented in this world, and then sort of develop your research interests out of that rather than going in with sort of a more theoretical agenda, setting out to prove that agenda. And the, the idea behind that is that that sort of allows for more surprise and sort of organic findings and more accurate findings in the research process. Um, so that was sort of what I went in with. I mean, I was, I had certain interests. So I knew I was interested in the creative process. I knew I was interested in experimentation and aesthetic judgment. So I think I went in with um, themes that I was interested in, but not at all a defined question. And that really slowly, slowly emerged through the process. So it wasn't until I was about a year into the research that I could even have told you like what sort of set of set of themes I was really clustering around, much less like a really defined research question, which is quite stressful when you're in grad school, I'll say. Um, but, but it did sort of more organically emerge like that. Okay, uh, Betsy Rosenwald says, I am interested in what makes a work of art iconic. What are the features of an iconic work? Does this change over time? Many so-called iconic works seem to be attributed to men. Would you say that the art world continues to be very sexist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so I think, you know, it somewhat depends, it depends a lot on the artist, but I definitely noticed that um, it was a lot harder to make something seen, be seen as iconic um, that was a conceptual theme versus a formal element just because um, conceptual themes can be explored across a wide variety of forms. And so it's not as like easily identifiable with the eye. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, some things I saw as sort of more iconic were um, things that were produced with an unusual media or technique that was immediately visual, re visually recognizable. Um, and so the um, pipe cleaner guy, like pipe cleaners were even in the contemporary art world, a pretty rare, um, a rare uh, uh, media to use. And so that was something that people would see and say, oh, that must be Lucky's work. And I think it was not only using the pipe cleaners, but also weaving them together and made this really grand gesture. So it's not only unusual, but also striking. And, and it's that sort of combination of unusual and striking, I think that can make something um, really widely recognizable because it's such a struggle to have thousands and thousands of artists competing for attention and you can make, you know, whatever outrageous thing you want. Um, so to rise above that sort of 
cacophony visually, it has to be both like distinctive plus striking. And uh, you can see this sort of battle play out if you go to a contemporary art fair where there's uh, hundreds of booths and, um, and dealers tend to show the work at these fairs because fairs make up 60% of their sales for the year. And so they're really, really important to do well at, the, at these fairs. And they tend to choose the artist that's doing the best in their gallery and their most iconic work. And the fair, as you can see, get pretty flashy. So um, like things like bright colors, unusual media, large works uh, tend to, to win out. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. How has that changed over time? Um, yeah, I, that's something like I think you would need a more in-depth analysis of, of what is has been seen as iconic over time. I think one thing art historically that has been that has changed over time is genres used to be more important in contemporary in contemporary art. So there was we had pop art, we had um, we had abstract expressionism, we had this really sort of quick succession of art genres that were all about challenging what art what art is and what can be defined as art. And that really ended with minimalism because now all the, now you couldn't reach any more boundaries. Art could be nothing. Um, and so after that, that's where you saw this sort of uncertainty and anxiety about what was more cutting edge. And people then tended to choose from like a hodgepodge of different styles and, and reference multiple different things. And so we're now in this place where instead of principally identifying with an art movement, people identify and draw from multiple references and sort of put them together. But you definitely see different moments happening in the art world, like in 2016. Um, and I'd say like from 2016 on, we've been in like this really heightened political moment in the art world where um, you see more sort of overtly political work than you did before. Um, so I think some of the changes that you see over time have to do with broader changes in our society. And then you had a question about sort of sexism in the art world. Yeah, so yeah. sexism, unfortunately, is definitely um, still a thing. I'm actually doing an analysis now of um, prices of contemporary art. And so I'm still doing that, but um, I'm seeing 75% of the work shown in fairs are, are men, um, are works by men, um, only 25 of works by women. Um, and um, I'm still doing a price analysis, but I'm, uh, I am predicting much lower prices um, for, for the work of, of female artists. And you can see this even in sort of the media that, um, that um, not, not all men and women use, of course, but um, how value is placed on, on various media. So painting tends to be the highest priced work, um, but a lot of women do, um, at, because their, their creative vision is associated with their identity and gender is often an important part of their identity, they often talk about things like domesticity or feminism and might incorporate crafts like um, weaving or something into their work as, um, as part of their concept of feminism. Um, and that work is priced much more, uh, much less because we devalue craft. So um, you see these sorts of reproductions of inequality within the art world. Um, and we are still far from, um, yeah, far from sort of equal pay and equal representation, unfortunately. Uh, do you know any artists who give up on being creative because they can't afford to create a whole body of work first to draw collectors, but need immediate income from selling pieces as soon as they are uh, completed? Are there viable gar galleries who promote individual pieces to help out artists in these circumstances? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say artists wouldn't, would never admit to me, to anyone, to even themselves, because it would be really a threat to their basic identity that they had given up on being creative. Um, that would be, I think, really fundamental identity threat. Um, so I th I'd say the farthest that someone would go and the farthest they, they've gone is to me is saying, you know, okay, this exhibition was coming up. 
I was really close to this deadline. So yes, I think I pushed this work out of the studio before it was ready because I needed to like make this exhibition deadline or, um, or, you know, sometimes people will do corporate commissions, which they will not really put on their resume. They won't really tell people about, um, but those are sort of high priced um, commissions that they see as low status. So that's sort of done as they would say on the DL or the down low. Um, and so that's the most you would have. Um, there aren't really contemporary galleries that are in that make as their model selling individual discrete pieces um, instead of selling the artist's creative visions because the creative vision is what collectors are buying, even lower status collectors. Um, they're still within the contemporary art world, so not low status enough that they would fall out of that world, but lower status collectors within the contemporary art world are often pejoratively referred to as buyers. And so they purchase the work of lower status artists who um, will, in, where there will be a little bit more of a direct sort of communication with the art dealer, like, well, more horizontal works or vert horizontal sells better than vertical works. So can you make more horizontal ones? But still the, the dealer is going to um, communicate to these buyers. These, this is the, the work that this person makes. This is her interest. This is her sort of core commitments. This is her style. Um, they would never sell the work as like, that's a pretty one, take it, go. It doesn't matter who the artist did it is. It always matters who the artist is and what their larger body of work is. Okay. What is the influence of the artistic zeitgeist represented by galleries in the creative process of the artist? So what is the influence of um, the, oh, so, um, yeah, so I would say, and tell me if I'm interpreting this right. Um, I think different galleries actually, this like brings up an important point. This different galleries also see themselves as having a creative vision and are, and collectors see themselves as having a creative vision as well. So for the gallery, their creative vision is composed of what they view as the distinctive sort of connected themes that the gallery uh, of, uh, um, that the, of the work of, that the gallery shows. So let's say they represent 20 artists Maybe they don't all fit together perfectly, but generally the gallery says, this is the types of themes we're interested in. And the gallery program sort of makes up the, the, the body of work that composes the creative vision. And for the collectors, um, it, um, the, the, um, the, for the collectors, the body of work is, is the body of work that they own. And they see that their work as having they see themselves as having sort of consistent interests and having a creative vision and they compose a conversation among the works to represent that in terms of every time they rehang their collection. Um, so how does this influence the creative process of the artist? So I would say galleries have creative visions that attract collectors that have somewhat aligned creative visions and they represent, galleries represent artists whose creative visions they view as aligned with their interests. So the gallery will find sort of indirect ways to communicate to the artist. This is like the kind of work that's going to sell the best. Um, and, but typically there should be a, a good match between the artist and the gallery. And so they try to find fits. So it would be strange if, um, like a gallery that's known for doing political work has like go uh, tries to represent an artist that seems like they do very sort of non-political work that's not going to be seen as a good match and the gallery then doesn't have access to the type of collectors that would be um, that would be interested in that artist's work so ideally they look for both the artist and, and the dealer look for whether or not they're a good fit for each other, not only in terms of sort of having equal status levels, but also in terms of the kind of work that the gallery shows and the kind of work that the artist makes. And then you don't have to have that like complete lack of alignment. Um, so I would say like, that's the way that those difficulties get avoided, but then 
um, if the artist is making work that the, the gallery doesn't think will sell either because of the sort of other attributes of the work or because it doesn't sort of fit within the program well um, typically you know if it didn't fit within the program they wouldn't represent the artist but if if that happened anyway they would probably find an indirect way to tell artists this and then the artist can decide whether they want to use that information or not if they don't use the information the gallery will usually so show the show the work anyway but over time, if the work continues not to sell, they might, they will drop an artist from representation. What defines high quality contemporary works of art? Okay, Hi, what defines high quality contemporary? So, so yeah, I mean, that's like a really tough question that, um, you know, I think everyone wants to, every collector wants to know the answer to that. And if it was really easily definable, then um, there would be no extreme uncertainty and sort of the market would look very different. Um, but again, it, it's, um, I think about having this sort of strong creative vision. So, so a creative vision that is deemed to have this balance of variation and consistency, um, but is also distinctive. So it has to not be repeating what other artists are doing but be relevant to the conversation. So, you know, we're having this political moment. Are you doing, maybe you don't have to do this, but are you doing political work in a way that's different from other people who are doing political work? And fine, now you're doing that kind of political work. So that's distinctive, but now are you recreating new series that maintain those distinctive elements, but also have, um, have aren't just repeating what you've done before. So I think it has to have this balance of consistency and variation on two levels. One, the work has to be, the body of work has to be distinctive, but also relevant to what other artists are making. And then within the body of work, each new series has to be dis different from the previous series, but also related to the previous series. So you have like two levels where you have to balance consistency and variation. Okay. Uh, let's see. How often does the artist have their own gallery, and what does this really mean to the uh, to the collector? Yeah. So, and it's impossible to tell like the exact percentage of artists that are represented by galleries, just because there's no like complete list of artists in New York or people who are trying to be artists. But in New York City, there's a few hundred galleries. Each of these galleries are representing twenty to thirty artists. So it's still a lot of people. And um, being represented by a gallery for someone that's collecting above sort of the buyer's level um, is almost like a precondition. Um, so some collectors take pride actually in like going into a studio and buying some low price works before someone is even represented. And then they get to brag um, if the person then later gets represented that they were sort of the first to discover this artist, which gives you cachet in the art world. But thinking about sort of investment value, generally people want that initial stamp of approval that this is someone that's represented. And so representation means so much. I mean, it's basically like, are you a person in this world? It's sort of the precondition for everything else, the sort of initial status signal on which other status signals are based. So if you're buying the work of someone not represented, you're understanding that this is a low price work, you're buying it because you like it. If they got representation, that would be great, but you're not really expecting any value to come back to you on that. Um, and so people only are really sort of buying for investment once the artist becomes represented. Um, and that's when they think, you know, that artist has like a chance of retaining economic value. And, and often the, the dealers are, the dealers are sort of the gatekeeper for the collector um, in terms of collectors have certain galleries that they buy repeatedly, multiple artists from that gallery over years and years. Because again, the gallery has a creative vision, the collector has a creative vision, the collector goes out and looks for galleries with aligned creative visions and says, okay, this gallery has a program that's 
related to um, my collection. So I'm going to sort of keep tabs on the artists that that gallery represents, the exhibitions coming up. And whenever I see um, an artist's body of work that I like, I'm going to learn more about the artist and maybe purchase something from, from their body of work. And so it's just really hard to sort of get exposure without that. And so there's, in, in terms of how that representation happens, there's a sort of courting ritual that occurs between artists and um, dealers where um, if uh, often um, dealers will look to lower, lesser known galleries or even other artists that their gallery represents for recommendations on new artists to find. And then when they like someone, they'll do a studio visit. If they like someone's work, they might invite them to be part of a group show where, where they'll have one or two works in the show. And then they might do another group show if that goes well. If that goes well, maybe that person gets a solo show or a two person show. And if one or two solo shows goes well, then maybe they offer them representation. So it's sort of this sort of dating that happens. And once they represent the artist, um, they refer to these relationships in, in sort of pretty um, intimate terms. So they call these like a marriage between the artist and the, the dealer. Um, and often these uh, relationships might last for, for years, for decades. Um, the artist, if the artist does really well, this is why it's, it's difficult for sort of mid-level galleries to, to make it because if the artist does really well, the artist could be poached by a higher status gallery. And if the artist stops selling and just isn't really doing much in terms of sales, um, after a while, the artist can ha have their representation drop. So um, the artist can leave the, the dealer or the dealer can, can leave the gallery. So that's sort of how these divorces can end up happening. Are you, are you aware of what the, do, do collectors buy and sell amongst themselves or do trades? And uh, what happens if the artist all of a sudden you know, loses favor? Do they try and dump some of these art pieces? Do they just throw them out ever or give any idea? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they'll, they would never throw them away, um, but you can, um, they might. Um, so first of all, collectors um, would generally not trade with each other. Um, although sometimes artists actually trade work with each other. Collectors generally don't trade work with each other if they are no longer interested in a work that they own. They have to, I mean, socially, they have to um, call the, the gallery and offer the gallery the right of first refusal. And basically, the gallery must first be offered the right to buy the work back um, at like a fair price in which the work has, let's say sometimes the work has gone up in value, but um, the, the, the gallery needs to buy the work or can buy the work back. And if the ga gallery doesn't want to buy the work back, the work can then go to auction. And galleries try to prevent works from going to auction um, if they don't think that the work will get a high price at auction, because if a work gets a low price at auction, that's a publicly posted price. And then now all these people own works at $100,000 and they just see that this work sold for $20,000 and that can really tank the artist's ability to sell their work in the future. So. That's how dealers try to sort of protect the, the price point of the artist's work. Um, often what uh, collectors will do is donate to a museum and then they can get a big tax write-off for that um, and tell everyone that they donated to this museum. Um, and a lot of times it just stays in the storage unit. Um, and you know, they, they just think so, that you know, that's sort of part of the process. Um, not every work retains value. Um, sometimes they'll still put that work up in their home and, and use it as an, an example of um, that they, they don't care about the value, they just love the work. And this is, you can see that they're exhibiting it even though it didn't retain value. All right, All right we'll take this, it'll be the last question uh, after a very, uh, very exciting night. Uh, have you seen any influence of the type of art you're discussing in any of the more commercial arts, say fashion, design, graphic art, architecture, uh, industrial art, say automobile design or household objects or jewelry. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, um, I see a lot of influences of actually all of those things. And so one thing that, um, you know, I, I also did a, um, an analysis of a few hundred exhibition reviews. And one of the most common themes that come up um, in evaluating contemporary art by critics evaluation of contemporary art is this idea of juxtaposition. Um, and so like juxtap a, a work that um, is seen as opposing juxtapo two opposite elements is seen as um, is often sort of valorized in the contemporary art world. Um, and sort of because of the way elite taste have changed over time. We now see that elites consume across lowbrow to highbrow sort of status in terms of genre and art forms. Whereas before they would only consume like opera, ballet, that kind of thing. Now they're consuming hip hop at the same time as they're consuming jazz. And so basically what I'm saying is like, we see this mixing of high and low cultural forms in our society more and more. And that's something that's often seen as really compelling in contemporary art. So you might have like, um, let's see, like um, advertisements as part of the art or um, sort of um, uh, artworks that are including elements of fashion design. But usually that'll be sort of a commentary on the juxtapos juxtaposing of these elements themselves. So it's not done without, um, it's done re very reflexively and very intentionally. And it's talked about in the, um, in the script of like what, or in the press release of the meaning of the work, this would be discussed as to why they're, um, they're integrating elements from fashion design or graphic art and, and what that means. And so, Basically in doing that, they are able to take an element that's seen as traditionally lower brow and elevate it by um, sort of intentionally elevate theorizing the element through their artwork. So it's, it's not done, it, it's, it's done very, very reflexively. Well, very good. All right, we've gotten several thank yous in the chat and I thank you as well too. This is a very interesting evening. Um, Hopefully you'll be coming east uh, this summer and uh, the Berkshires will get to see you. And I would expect if you walk the streets of Lenox, you may find a crowd around you because all <laughs> now you're going to be famous. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I really enjoyed um, the presenting to you and all of your very wonderful questions. So I really appreciate it. It was great to connect with the Berkshires again. Thank you. Good evening. Bye.